Uh, so welcome, Dr. Ramakrishnan. We're delighted to have you join us today. Uh, I'd like to start uh, this interview by giving you the opportunity to give us a little bit of a bio. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your expertise and uh, sort of what your interests are in terms of research and capacity building. So I was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison for nearly 20 years. Uh, I moved to Yahoo to lead the uh, computer science lab there. Uh, and I served as chief scientist for various parts of the company for a few years. Uh, in 2012, I moved to Yahoo uh, to Microsoft. And here uh, I'm the CTO for data and a technical fellow. So in this role, I basically think about uh, data, data platforms, including machine learning and uh, help think through a roadmap as part of that. Right. Wonderful. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, so I'll start with my first question, sort of a nice segue from uh, your background. What do you see as the current and future demand for graduates uh, in AI? So more at the master's and PhD level uh, in sort of your industry, which is tech. So what do you see as current and future demand uh, at the graduate and PhD levels? Yeah, you know, in virtually every domain, um, whether you're talking about science, manufacturing, or finance, AI machine learning has become a key tool you know, for understanding data. And data has become another lens through which you understand the underlying uh, phenomena or enterprise. So using analytics, including AI machine learning, to draw insights about what's going on, right? And what's going on, depending on what you're doing, it could be the business of your company. If you're a scientist, it is the nature of the underlying scientific challenge. And then through that set of insights, you try and go back and operate more effectively. So this could be refinements in day-to-day -day business processes. Or in the case of science, it might be new hypotheses for which you go back to the lab and gather evidence, and then you come back to the data to evaluate what you found, to understand, to hypothesize afresh. And then this virtual cycle continues. And in many cases, a wet lab and a computer lab are now extensions of each other. Experiments in one are designed based on what you find in the other. And given all of this, uh, there are two kinds of people who are increasingly in demand. Engineers who know how to build robust software systems, who really understand all the different ways data is generated, stored, managed, and who understand machine learning and can bring all those together to build tools, right? That allow you to get at the data in a secure governed way and then to apply machine learning, uh, such people are in great demand. So basically engineers who build ML and data platforms. The other group is data scientists. These are people who are typically domain experts uh, or who work closely with domain experts who are deep in the underlying mathematics and modeling techniques for machine learning, who understand you know, appropriate tools and toolkits who also understand you know, the relevant technology they need to get at data in a safe way. And these are the people where you know, the ML uh, and problem solving road meets the rubber happens, right? Mm -hmm. These data scientists are the second category of people uh, in increasing demand. Thank you. Uh, so taking that thought further, what do you see as uh, what in India they often call hot skills. What do you see as uh, sort of the emerging trends in AI and machine learning that you're seeing uh, in the current workforce? And what do you see as the next five years? What are the skills uh, machine learning and AI graduates yeah. will need? So let's work backwards from the okay. types of people I just described. Mm -hmm. If you think about 
the first set, platform engineers, people mm -hmm. who build the tools. Mm -hmm. uh, they need uh, to have the skills for software development, front and center, let's be very clear. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, they also need to know what they're building. And in the case of ML tools, they need to understand machine learning. So it's over and above your generic software. Right? At the same time, this doesn't mean they need to know any less of standard development practices or uh, code development life cycles and software engineering tools, mm -hmm. or depending on what you're doing, uh, the underlying data management software and how that works, security, mm -hmm. privacy, there's a range of things. Uh, but in particular, they need to also be able to bring a good understanding of machine learning because that's the class of tool they're building. Uh, if you take data scientists, the second group of people, their core job is to get at the data, to understand it. When you build machine learning models, a lot of what you do is setting up the problem correctly. So, you know, you're capturing the salient aspects of the problem through the features you're exposing to the machine learning algorithms. So the models you build, they are a good mirror of the underlying processes, right? Uh, otherwise, your, what your models tell you isn't particularly pertinent to what's really going on. And so these people, they need to understand the domain. Uh, if you're talking about someone who's modeling evolutionary biology, mm -hmm. you don't take a political scientist and teach them data mining or data uh, mm -hmm. science and say, go have fun, right? You want someone who's deeply rooted in the science mm -hmm. of biology. Uh, or at the very least, you need someone who is literate and who can partner with an expert in biology, right? At the same time, these people really need to understand statistics, right? Machine learning at the end of the day is to a large extent, uh, advanced statistics, advanced uh, linear algebra, vector algebra. Uh, it's mathematics uh, brought to bear on interpreting data. So they need to understand the math uh, they need to understand the domain and they need to understand the tools that allow them to extract insights, to bring this math to the domain, to model and derive insights, right? Uh, and this in a nutshell is what we should be trying to teach. Great, thank you so much. I, I love the pitch about statistics and Full disclosure, I'm a statistician by training, so thank you so much for that. Okay, um, I, I know. So, you know, you talked about, you know, having an evolutionary biologist, understand enough of data, so, you know, having people sort of speak different languages. Um, so you're saying those skills are critical for AI and machine learning graduate students or PhD students. Do you see uh, that happening in academic programs? What do you see from the industry perspective as gaps in the knowledge and skills among the current crop? Uh, or where do you yeah. think, yeah. Yeah, there'll be plenty of data mining or data scientists who are not evolutionary biologists, right? Yeah. My point rather was, depending on the domain, right. you need expertise in the domain. And it could be evolutionary biology, it could be astronomy, it could be uh, business process automation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where I see the field going reminds me a little bit of what I saw in computer science uh, back when I was entering it, right? In the early days, many computer science departments were founded uh, by folks who knew numerical uh, analysis or statistics mm -hmm. or electrical engineering, all these adjacent disciplines, right. they seeded the very first computer scientists. And there was a period of time when we were short of people who grew up as computer scientists, right? And we had all kinds of cross-training programs. Uh, we're seeing some of that. We're seeing an increasing number of data science certification programs, master's level programs, even undergraduate curriculum, beginning to reflect majors in data science. Uh, my own take is, uh, when it comes to the first category of person we talked about, the engineering platform candidates, 
frankly, these are more likely to come out of core computer science programs, right? Rather than the emerging data science programs. The second category of people, the data scientists will come out of these uh, data science programs. However, to answer your question directly, uh, I'm seeing the approach to bringing together domain science, science expertise happen in many ways. And I don't really know whether there'll be one dominant way going forward. Uh, I see a spectrum. For example, as part of a computer science or data science curriculum, you have the ability to, or the requirement in some cases, to do minor uh, clusters of courses in domain disciplines, right? Conversely, if I look at programs in the sciences, in basically every discipline in the university, uh, they are increasingly requiring introductory programming, introductory statistics, uh, maybe even data science uh, as minor uh, requirements or right? just like mathematics, physics, English. There are some basic courses you take mm -hmm. uh, as part of your university training, no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. We are seeing computer science, data science enter that mainstream, right? And so these are two complementary approaches. And I think it's healthy that both we are exploring both. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, you need some broad skills as the field matures. All the things we talked about will become mm -hmm. deeper and deeper. The old days when someone could learn all these skills on the fly, uh, people like me, when we entered computer science, right? there were no computer science undergraduate programs. Mm -hmm. But over the years, as these come in and there are people who are deeply trained, the barrier will become higher and higher. The requirements, the sophistication will grow. But I don't think you will ever completely decouple the importance of combining these tools with the domain where you're applying them and trying to advance whatever it is you're doing. So that domain expertise married to uh, data science skills, mm -hmm. I think will be a continuing uh, thread in the story. So can I just push you on that? Um, so you are talking about programs that have to be inherently interdisciplinary, right? Um, at some level, you need uh, students in computer science to understand another domain or domain scientists to understand uh, you know, some of the basic computing, uh, computational tools, statistics. Is that happening in graduate programs? Uh, do you see a lot of it or do, would you like to see more? So to be clear, I see this as much more important. In fact, uh, de rigor mm -hmm. in the second category of persona, the data mm -hmm. scientists. The data engineers, I think are well served by a traditional computer science curriculum okay. and they'll just take the appropriate uh, you know, collection of ML related courses they need, to, right? Uh, but let's stay focused on data science for a moment here. Mm -hmm. This category, I do think uh, graduate programs are recognizing the interdisciplinarity uh, to varying degrees. Mm -hmm. If you take the data science programs, often they have capstone projects, which require you to work with some discipline. Uh, they offer the opportunity to do additional courses, like every program, mm -hmm. the minor requirement, where you can go, you can do whatever you want, but there is the opening to right. go deeper into a domain, which I hope many people will do, right? Uh, I think this notion of, I'm a data scientist uh, at large, mm -hmm. uh, domain agnostic, there is that today, right? My guess is over the years, that's going to diminish, right? You're gonna be more and more cognizant of the fact that you're gonna go deeper in mm -hmm. some broad area. Uh, conversely, and this is unequivocally happening. If you go look at virtually any university, mm -hmm. uh, 20 years ago, uh, maybe mathematics was the most popular course, intro mathematics in a university curriculum. Uh, or maybe it was intro statistics, or maybe it was intro to physics or mm -hmm. English. Mm -hmm. Today, I'd be willing to bet over half your universities, if you did, the, did a poll, mm -hmm. it would be the intro programming course, right? Uh, across 
the board, computer science departments are facing a real challenge, how to do this, how to carry out the service responsibility, right? And that tells us something. Programming is the tip of the iceberg. We are having a more specialized conversation, but I see this, mm -hmm. it's a, a tide that lifts all boats. Mm -hmm. I see increasingly, especially in graduate schools, uh, people using the flexibility of a graduate program to take more and more courses that give them computing skills. Right? Uh, and that's becoming intentional. Right? Earlier it used to be, hey, uh, if I can't get a job in my specialized discipline, maybe I can go become a programmer. Mm -hmm. right? uh, I don't think that's what's going on anymore. Yes, there's some of that still. But increasingly people are saying, I want to be an outstanding fill in the blank, mm -hmm. okay? And I realize that in order to do that, I need to have the ability to use the state of the art tools. Mm -hmm. And in the same way I learn how to work in a wet lab, I'm going to have to learn how to work in a data lab. Okay, great. Um, so at Microsoft, I, I know you hired a number of uh, masters and PhD uh, students you know, coming out of computer science or data science programs. Uh, do you offer any sort of in-house training at what levels? And do you see any gaps, both in terms of technical skills as well as soft skills that uh, maybe you have to address through uh, the in-house training? It's a good question. So, you know, first off, Microsoft is a big place. I wouldn't presume to speak for the organization as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I look at the people we hire that I interact with in the data platform teams, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we are deeply technical. A lot of what we hire are people in the first category, data engineers. We build a number of these platforms we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. And we also have you know, many people in the second category, the data scientists, because we use them ourselves to understand what we are doing. Our underlying infrastructure, for example, Mm -hmm. produces many exabytes of data, which we analyze in order to operate more efficiently. So when I look at our samples in these two categories, we are fortunate in being able to have a high bar uh, attract from the top end of the talent pool. And by and large, we don't actually bring in people and have pro training programs to teach them machine learning or data science. Mm -hmm. if, they are, if they're not already pretty good, they usually don't find their way in here, right? At the same time, uh, you know, we take many aspects of working with data in particular, extremely seriously as a company. And we have lots of learning programs as part of our broad learning, mm -hmm. continuous learning frameworks, mm -hmm. right? Everyone, me, every single employee, we take we are mandated to take several mm -hmm. courses every year and continue to do this, right? And these include things like ethical and privacy aspects of working with data, right? Uh, security and threats from hacking. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these things we do. The one thing I would say, and I see this even in the pool of people we hire, and I feel certain it must be a systemic issue. Mm -hmm. Let's, it, it goes back to my conviction that data science is an interdisciplinary effort at its core. Mm -hmm. And that means you need to be able to communicate, you need to be able to collaborate, right? There's an area where not all technical people have the necessary skills. And uh, at the same time, I don't know how prevalent uh, other companies, other institutions, uh, training regimes are when it comes to these other issues, security, privacy, ethics, mm -hmm. right? And those are, I think, very, very important considerations, right? Uh, so these are things I would say, you know, there's only so much time in the day. So mm -hmm. a typical university curriculum has to make some choices, yeah. but I hope that learning can be a an ongoing thing. Uh, and many of these areas, the law, for example, is changing mm -hmm. continuously. These yep. are things you need to stay up with. Right. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, so a little bit of a, a segue here. So we've talked about, you know, the needs of industry, the uh, skill sets, et cetera. Uh, so now moving more to the R&D space, um, could you describe any uh, research development collaborations or capacity building activities uh, you have with academic partners? Uh, is this, uh, I know Microsoft has, has, has done a lot, but maybe a couple of examples of uh, what you see as the value uh, of these sorts of industry academia collaborations? Yeah, you know, like many large companies, mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft values academia and academic relationships, collaboration, mm -hmm. right? And ultimately we recognize that the people who eventually come to work at Microsoft uh, begin their early professional training, either in the educational or research programs in many of these universities, mm -hmm. right? So we, in MSR, Microsoft Research, has outreach programs they administer where they do things like faculty fellowships uh, or graduate fellowships or even undergraduate scholarships or awards where on a competitive basis, uh, they hand out money to either augment what someone does in their institution or occasionally to come visit. Uh, beyond this, many universities have various kinds of affiliate programs, right? That allow companies to have a broader uh, partnership. Uh, we sometimes participate in those. Uh, and what is ubiquitous is internships. So mm -hmm. when students, be it undergraduates or graduates, uh, look to go work somewhere over the summer, right? Uh, for them, it's a window into what they're gonna be doing after they graduate. Uh, we have lots of intern programs across the company, right? And uh, so we have this continuous stream of people coming in over the summer months. And often that dialogue continues after they return, right? So these are the various ways you typically see uh, Microsoft engaging uh, with academia. Do you also have the reverse? Do you have folks from Microsoft going to academic institutions to, uh, to teach um, or so, team teach courses? Is that something you do? A great question. So there are people who sometimes go teach at the university. Mm -hmm. But it's usually uh, not a full-time thing, right? Uh, I know folks, for example, who go teach regular courses as part of the undergraduate or graduate curriculum at the University of Washington, mm -hmm. right here in Seattle. And they do this because these are world-renowned scientists mm -hmm. or people with incredible engineering uh, yeah. insight, and they go teach these courses, sometimes existing courses on the books, which they are well qualified to teach, or sometimes new courses that speak to some of the things they are doing, right? Uh, but they still continue to be primarily Microsoft employees for the most part, right? Uh, I see this happening in places where there is a Microsoft technical uh, talent pool in the same place where there is a, a university of some kind. Uh, and occasionally people go teach in week-long seminars and things like this, right? Which could be a different place, a different location involving travel. Uh, but we don't, to my knowledge, have a lot of people mm -hmm. who do a formal rotation. So I, I, I want to sort of touch on this. There have been conversations about, you know, industrial PhDs. So having uh, PhD students actually work on their dissertation with industry, I, you know, the programs both in the US and some I've seen in Germany. Do you have any thoughts about something like that, especially in emerging areas like AI or machine learning? Yeah, so again, there's a balance to be maintained. Mm -hmm. uh, so Microsoft, my group actually has a strong relationship with uh, Wisconsin Madison where I happen to teach as it happens, but this relationship was independent of me as it, to be clear. But we have a lab in Madison. Many students and faculty from there collaborate with us. And when they do, one of the unique things we can offer is, hey, here are our real problems. 
you're welcome to work on them. Uh, anytime you do this, you have to be very intentional to protect the parties involved. First and foremost, you have to think about the students. Right? And you also, as a company, have to be responsible about IP. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you protect both of these? So in this case, there was a lot of thoughtful legal uh, mm -hmm. framework put in place uh, to help. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you can have the frameworks in place, but you also need to have responsible people overseeing the interaction because mm -hmm. there is a trade-off where you say, you know what? you can publish on this, you cannot publish that. Mm -hmm. And that is necessary at the end of the day, if you are serious about protecting IP. In some cases, the IP is secondary and then you can be much more free. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, anytime you make such a call, there mm -hmm. is the potential that you are being restrictive uh, with someone who needs to be able to share what they are doing to graduate to mm -hmm. publish. So the people overseeing this on both the university and the company side mm -hmm. have to be very thoughtful to ensure what they work on is something that in appropriate timely fashion can be published in a way that provides the right student or researcher to get credit. And these are the kinds of things that typically require relationships. Right? Mm -hmm. People need to know and trust each other uh, if you are to get this right. Yeah, it's tricky, but, but it, you it, know- When it can be worked out, I think it's very, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's tricky, but if you can pull it off, it, act, it brings great value. Okay. Great. So that sort of takes me to my next question. Um, you know, what do you see as examples of sort of big research problems that really could benefit from having industry academia collaboration? So either, research challenges driven by industry that you know, uh, motivates graduate students or collaborations to address you know, some uh, big challenge uh, sort of more broadly in the AI machine learning data science space. So when I talk about research, I'm gonna scope what I say yeah. to research in the computer science domain. Uh, sure. I won't really try and address research in the domains. Mm -hmm. right? where again, I believe a partnership is uh, relevant, valuable, as you know. Mm -hmm. Speaking strictly from the perspective of computer science research, going back to my time in acad academia, uh, I've always had this conviction that computer science is an applied discipline. Mm -hmm. And while not all of it needs to be immediately applicable, right? much of it, should be looking at the world through the lens of how can I make something better? And that applied dimension, right? Uh, companies of various kinds, whether it's a Microsoft or whether it is a Genentech, doesn't matter, right? A lot of what's actually you know, making a big impact practically in, through products, through services is in those companies. Mm -hmm. And academics who invest in learning about the problems and finding a way to partner and maybe work together. I will be doing work that long-term is more grounded and more impactful. It's also more painful because mm -hmm. all of this slows you down a little bit. It has some guardrails you have to respect. Uh, so that's how, from the very beginning, I've always worked closely with researchers. My students have always encouraged them to go out and do internships, mm -hmm. uh, things like this. So my answer would be very simply, pretty much everything you consider doing, consider doing it in light of some kind of a partnership that informs you about its applicability, both today and tomorrow. Beyond that blanket statement, there is one concrete thing I'd like to call out. Mm -hmm. Right now, I think we are going through a watershed shift. Mm -hmm. uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the way you created a computing environment in a university, whether it was to teach a programming class or to conduct systems research, you bought a bunch of machines and put them in a room and built the air conditioning and let people go have fun, right? 
that is, I think, not the way to do it anymore. Uh, look, every company on the planet increasingly uses public clouds, right? Why should we as researchers and educators not do the same? The overhead of building your own physical lab, mm -hmm. there are limited scenarios where that makes sense, but for the mm -hmm. most part, it does not make sense. And we don't do it today for the most part because of a lack of familiarity and a lack of understanding of what it takes. Mm -hmm. And for their part, the major cloud companies, mm -hmm. their primary customers are the big large enterprises and universities and research institutions bring their own opportunities and challenges. And we are in the early stages mm -hmm. of understanding that. But if we can figure out how to do this and, uh, you know, in Washington, uh, uh, Edla Zarska, uh, together with folks at Berkeley, uh, elsewhere, San Diego, I believe, uh, they are trying to work with NSF to create mm -hmm. uh, a cloud bank, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. These vehicles right. for academics to more easily access mm -hmm. computing clouds. Uh, those kinds of initiatives, right? And we'll probably have two or three trials before we get it right. But whatever it is, I think that's where the kind of multinational government, academia kind of effort you're, you're, you're initiating can have a disproportionate impact. How do we think about our computing infrastructure for education and research over the next decade, right? And they should address many things. Make sure that our researchers and students are able to access the very latest technologies, mm -hmm. but at the same time are doing so in the most cost-effective way, right? And this, if the right answer for many, many companies, if not all companies, mm -hmm. is going to be the cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, shouldn't it be the answer for academic institutions too. And I'm basically raising questions that are sometimes uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm saying departmental labs mm -hmm. have a place, but maybe much less than in the past. Uh, if you take large uh, computing centers, mm -hmm. uh, supercomputing centers as they are called, mm -hmm. uh, these are a big, big part of our funding envelope. Right. And right. I'm asking, what is their place going forward? Mm. And they will have a place. I have no doubt about that. Mm. But they will not have the same ubiquity mm. because many of their past use probably is better served in future mm. by relying on public infrastructure or commercial cloud infrastructure. Right? Mm. And those are not comfortable conversations to have because the people thinking about them from the university side often Mm -hmm. uh, they are split mm -hmm. right, by nature of what they do. So, but these are nonetheless difficult, important conversations mm -hmm. uh, we need to have as a community and figure out how to take uh, research and academia into the next decade. So that's, you know, a perfect uh, sort of segue to the next question. You've already talked about cloud and you're right. Uh, NSF for its big data programs would actually provide cloud credits to the PIs, to the awardees uh, on any of the servers. So all the big cloud providers uh, helped in some sort of co-funding. So what do you see, um, you've already talked about the challenges. What do you see the role of governments uh, in trying to uh, help create new initiatives or you know, investments in infrastructure both from the R&D perspective and also training uh, the workforce. So what can agencies uh, on the US side, NSF in India, uh, agencies like the Department of Science and Technology, where should oh, they be yeah. thinking in terms of new initiatives and infrastructure investments? So ultimately those investments that the governments make can be hugely influential. Mm -hmm. So if you take the cloud discussion, when you decide to put your next bazillion uh, dollars or rupees mm -hmm. into an on-campus uh, data center 
or earmarks for that same campus, that same community to use public clouds, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to make a huge difference in what the university does, what other universities do, right? Mm -hmm. But likewise, let's switch over to the other things we were talking about, the mm -hmm. different forms of interaction, collaboration, right? Uh, who owns the IP? It's not just a company issue. As a university, right, you own IP. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the US, there are rules like Beidou, which mm -hmm. govern uh, to what extent the university must hold certain rights or the in individual inventors hold mm -hmm. certain rights. And some of this is very unique to each university in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, creating some clarity, doing this in a way that encourages enterprise, that encourages people with great ideas in a university to go take it out and do something commercial with it, either on their own or through partnership with some company. However, but in a way that maximizes the likelihood of creating and enriching this flywheel mm -hmm. of academic industry innovation, right? Uh, a lot of innovation is seeded in universities in the US model, right? which India has also adopted. Right. And the key to that is to unlock that innovation to go enter into the commercial mainstream. And that's often where a lot of the friction is. Mm -hmm. And the friction is partly IP. The friction is partly a lack of know-how. Mm -hmm. So there are people in universities, very smart, deep in the technologies, completely clueless when it comes to how to bring this to commercial success, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and creating a more permeable uh, barrier between these mm -hmm. ecosystems uh, is where I think this potential. Now, don't put me on the spot by saying what exactly, right? But I'm, I'm pointing to a broad problem area. These are subtle things where I don't necessarily want to say something concrete mm -hmm. without being thoughtful about it, right? Uh, but that is the second area, right? Mm -hmm. The third I would say is plain and simple funding. If you take research, mm -hmm. what proportion of the budget is it? And compared to other things we're investing mm -hmm. and comparing its potential transformative value to the economy, are we investing enough, right? Uh, a large part of what I think we professionals need to do is advocacy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I've often heard it said that the transistor mm -hmm. paid for all of the labs forevermore, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but you don't know a priori what is the next transistor. Right? Uh, and so who's gonna fund it? At some level, in the old days, it used to be companies with monopolies because Frankly, they use these as these lab investments as tax write-offs. Right. The system in a weird way worked, mm -hmm. right? But today, we need to be more intentional and governments, I think, have huge agency. Mm -hmm. The decisions they make and the vehicles they choose to encourage all of this can be hugely consequential in the path mm -hmm. that technology takes, right? And so being very intentional about finding a way to first create a strong research culture in universities mm -hmm. to where companies and others continue to see them as a place we must mm -hmm. engage with, right? Uh, and then finding ways to get the ideas to flow freely across the full ecosystem, mm -hmm. the private sector, as well as mm -hmm. the educational sector. Uh, along all these dimensions we talked about. Uh, that's, I think, the challenge. And, yeah. So you talked about the transistor, and I, I, I'm just going to ask you to uh, give me an opinion on this. There's always a tension um, when you see it in the funding agencies, both in India and the US, uh, about basic research, so foundational research, more theoretical. You know, there's a long arc to seeing something tangible. And then the more applied research. And there is this underlying tension between the communities. You want to see results. So where do you think agencies, uh, you know, you talked about, you know, the whole path from 
basic research through innovation, uh, but there need to be investments at all levels. So do you see any tensions? Uh, do you see oh, any no opportunities? tensions. Anytime you have $100 <laughs> and you're trying to apportion it across three segments, trust me, there will be tensions. Uh, and we'd be hypocritical not to acknowledge that. Uh, that said, how do you resolve those tensions? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, G.H. Hardy is said to have been very offended by anything applied. Mm -hmm. If mathematics was applied, he felt it was not really, really mathematics. Uh, as an applied scientist, obviously I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. But I do like something about his approach. He had clarity when he did something because it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. He didn't try to justify it as useful, okay? Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I can't you know, count the number of proposals or papers that talk about something beautiful, mm -hmm. but justify it in terms that are, oh, it's super applicable, right? And we are encouraging this by not saying outright. Sometimes foundational research is foundational, theoretical, beautiful. It informs what we do, but there isn't an immediate applicability and we value that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I do believe we need to invest in that end of the spectrum, right? But at the same time, it should be a portfolio. What percentage goes there? What percentage goes into stuff that is at the other end of the spectrum? You, you know there are no immovable rocks, but there are some non-trivial things at the cutting edge of the problem. Uh, you want people to go work on it. So it's the next six months, one year time frame. And how much do you invest in the middle? The stuff that's speculative that tomorrow could turn into a big deal or just fail, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's incredible value in failing fast. Mm -hmm. okay. That whole spectrum, pure research, extremely long range or just foundational in nature, uh, very short term, where really it's hard problems that you just are accelerating solving. It's not problems that are unknowable mm -hmm. or that change the direction of the field. And then things in the middle, which are potentially the most transformative, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're very intentional about changing something, but you're taking extremely high risk uh, bets that may not pan out. And in fact, when they don't pan out, failure is often successful if done right and you take the right lessons away from it. This middle ground is where I would put a majority of my funding, but I would be very intentional about funding at both edges as well because otherwise the middle doesn't stay grounded. That's a fantastic answer. Thank you. Uh, so my last question is, is, you know, we've talked about the role of governments and agencies. Uh, so now coming to the, you know, larger bilateral, the US-India collaboration, the strategic partnership, um, what do you see as opportunities for collaborations between the two countries, especially in the capacity building and workforce development space? and We've talked about internships and fellowships. What do you see as models, mechanisms to help maybe catalyze and also sustain uh, these sorts of relationships between the two countries? So do you have any suggestions for how we can yeah. do this at a small level or how we can also scale it up? So let me say the obvious. Mm -hmm. Anything the U.S. government ought to be thinking about with respect to the U.S. universities, mm -hmm. the Indian government ought to be thinking about with respect to Indian universities and vice mm -hmm. versa. And therefore, there's a lot of learnings from each other to be had, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And as you well know, our academic communities mm -hmm. are deeply intertwined. These yep. are not silos. Already, there's a ton of uh, interplay, right? I have students who have been on the faculty, are on the faculty at places like ISC, IIT Madras, IIT Bombay, mm -hmm. uh, and they're doing some of the state-of-the-art work anywhere, mm -hmm. not just in India. Uh, at the same time, you know, if you look at how the IITs got started, for example, mm -hmm. uh, there were collaborations, very intentional collaborations with other countries. IIT Madras, where I went. It was a partnership with Germany okay. and universities there. Uh, we could explore models, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. where labs 
pair up with one or more partner institutions elsewhere in the world, in the US, for example. Mm -hmm. And this is facilitated. And mm -hmm. obviously when you do that, in, in today's world, you don't have to be physically in the same place. We can be, you and I are talking. Right? Mm -hmm. But there is still huge value, especially in the world of research, mm -hmm. to sitting together, drinking coffee and uh, mm -hmm. you know, playing with a whiteboard, right? Mm -hmm. There's a human uh, yeah. water cooler effect. How do we facilitate more of that through Fulbright-like programs, perhaps? Mm -hmm. uh, how do we have joint collaborations? Uh, one way to incentivize all of that is to put money on the table for those kinds of programs, for those kinds of collaborations. Um, the other thing we already touched on, many of the public commercial clouds today are mm -hmm. US-based, right? Mm -hmm. Fine, mm -hmm. that doesn't need to get in the way. Virtually all of these have Indian footprints in terms of data centers and so on. So across governments, can we find a way of saying, how do we get the, uh, cloud collaboration right across India, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and here maybe partner with NSF, which is already mm -hmm. thinking about this it's a, at an early stage in the mm -hmm. US. So I think there are many opportunities like this. Wonderful. Uh, and we are, so one of the things we're doing is reaching out to federal agencies on both sides. So we are having the conversations with NSF and to say, okay, what's worked, what's not. Uh, but I think the cloud is uh, something that you know, we've heard a lot from in the Indian academic community. Um, you know, they'd love to get that sort of resource because you're right, setting up huge computing infrastructure now is maybe not the way to go. Um, but again, that's a conversation with the Indian government also because, you know, we're talking about localization and uh, so there are issues that are going to keep cropping up. Uh, but you know, this has been fascinating. Do you have any sort of last thoughts, anything uh, else? sort of broadly about capacity building? Um, uh, I think we covered a lot of territory and it's really exciting what you're trying to do. So all the very best. Yes, thank you so much, Aragu. Really appreciate the time and uh, we will get back to you. So what we're planning to do is uh, try to synthesize and then come up with some um, you know, discussion points for hopefully a workshop. And at the end, we would like to put together a white paper for the two governments to say, look, here we've talked to the community, all the key stakeholders, and here is where we see sweet spots for collaboration. And here's where we could do something quickly. And here's where you may need to uh, talk about a little more investment or thought into how the governments can collaborate. So again, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. All right, thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.